If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. And we'll reference one other text. I think both of these uh, portions of Scripture you're familiar with. Luke 15, story about the lost son, the prodigal son. Also Proverbs chapter 22, just one verse, verse 6. So again, I think you're familiar with them, but I pray that God would make them afresh for all of you today as God has laid this message upon my heart. Luke 15, beginning with verse 11, and I'm going to skip a few verses in this parable, and I'll tell you in just a moment. But Luke 15, 11 says this, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And so we're going to skip a few verses to verse 17, but basically his younger son took his inheritance and he went and wasted it all, and God describes a few things for us there, but we're going to skip to verse 17 where he has something happen in his heart. Verse 17 says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And that's where I'm going to stop reading this parable. In light of today being Father's Day, I thought it appropriate to consider a parable that is primarily, primarily about the greatest example of a father's love and character none other than the Father in Heaven. And the text we have read this morning is often called, as I've already mentioned, the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. And I agree that God, yes, uses these texts in particular to teach us much about this younger son who took his portion of inheritance and, as the Scripture said, went and wasted it on riotous living to fulfill his desires. The Lord certainly teaches us many things about this portion of text and about what the younger son did. But as I said in my devotion this past week, and I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to listen to it, when you understand the person of God, when you understand His character, His nature, how He acts, how He functions, things make sense. Things make sense when you understand God, who He is, why He does what He does. We understand ourselves, we understand life, we understand how all of this mess out there, how it fits in the bigger picture. If we will just take a moment and moments to investigate for ourselves who this God is. We all need this. So once again, let us examine the God of Holy Scripture. The Father in Heaven is who we need to be focusing on. And I assume, again, that many, if not all of you, have read or heard this parable before. And in the very beginning of it, I submit to you, there is a portion of this text I had never considered before. As God laid this portion of Scripture on my heart, I'm thinking Father's Day, and I was led to this parable a portion that gives us greater insight into this Father in Heaven that we're speaking of. 
It said in verse 12, these are the words it said. You can look there again with me if you'd like. The younger of them said to his father, the younger son, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. That seems very simple. We could really breeze over this pretty quickly. But the younger son of this father came to him one day and said, Father, give me my portion of inheritance. Now, first of all, for a child to even ask that before the death of a father is an indication of extreme disrespect, selfishness, and when you think about it, it's outright appalling that a son would even ask this of his father. Give me what I know is going to be mine before you are, you're even gone from this earth. Go ahead and give it to me. It's so disrespectful. So can you imagine in this young man's heart already thinking about what will be his? Not only is he thinking about it, but he convinces himself in his own mind. You know what? I want it now. I don't know when my father will die. That could be longer than I want it to be, so give me my portion now. So not only was this going on in his heart, he actually approached his father and asked for it. Can we see where this young man's heart was? How selfish he was? But listen, this is the part I'd never considered before. And based on what we see in the Scriptures, the next thing it said was basically when he asked for his portion, the father did it. Immediately. He did it. The son asked, and immediately God tells us when he says, look back at the verse, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. What is the next thing it says? And he divided unto them his living. i would never thought about that before. The father said, here you go. As disrespectful as it was, as appalling as this is even today to ask that of a father. His father said, here you go. It hit me like it had never hit me before. Now, God doesn't give us every detail throughout the Bible when he gives us scriptures. He doesn't give us every detail of an account necessarily. For I'm sure the father tried to talk his younger son out of doing this. Or maybe there had been previous conversations about this in the past. We don't know. God doesn't give us those details. But I think it would be right to assume that his father had talked to him at some point and tried to talk him out of this. But what we do know is that the son demanded his portion of inheritance and his father gave it. Now, if we can see the arrogance the selfishness, the disrespect, and the other utter disregard for his father's household, we would do well to ask the question, why did the father do that? Why did he do it? Why did he give it to him? If your child came to you right now in this moment and said, give me everything that will be mine when you're gone, think of all the ways that would make you feel. Give me my portion of my inheritance now. Think how that would make you feel if your child did that. Think about what it would do in your spirit. Would you not question your child's love, respect, and appreciation for you? Would you not question that? I think you would. Would you not think that material things of this world are more important than your relationship with them? I would think that as I think about my own children. If they ask me, give me what's going to be mine when you're gone. But listen, that's exactly what happened in this text. So again, why did this father give him his portion? Why didn't the father just say no? We could say no. As a parent, you better be saying no from time to time. But why didn't he say no? I believe it's an important question because it is, the answer is one every father, every mother for that matter, must always remember when it comes to raising your children. And that is this. God did not just make you 
the parent in his image. He made your children in his image as well. And you know what that means, right? If you've been a part of this church for any number of days or weeks or years, you know what that means to be made in the image of God. But if you don't know, let me tell you. God did not just give parents the ability and the capacity to choose right and wrong. He did not just call parents to learn of God and to make godly choices and godly decisions. He wants that for your children also. You knew that already, didn't you? I hope you knew that. And some of you listening think this is so obvious or you already know this. But really listen to what God is saying through this parable. Listen to what God is saying through this father to his son, his grown son, by giving him the portion. Why didn't he just say no? Why did he give it to him? Listen to what God is teaching us. He said, here you go. Here's what he's telling us. Son, I can't make your choices for you. I cannot change for you what is inside of you, where your heart is. I can't change your heart. God the Father is teaching us this. If you set your heart on serving yourself, if your heart is set on doing what you want, instead of listening to my godly counsel, instead of doing this right, I can't stop you. Parents, you are made in the image of God. Children, you are made in the image of God. That means you choose for you. God says, I can't stop you, and I won't stop you. He won't do it. God is reminding all of us that He will never, and I repeat, never, ever make you love Him. He will never force us to do what we don't desire in our own hearts to do. And that is what is happening with this younger son. How appalling, how disrespectful. Give me my portion of inheritance. The father said, you know what? I can't make you love God. I can't make you do what I want you to do. Here you go. You do it. That's what God is teaching us. The son had a choice to make. His father let him make it. Every indication that we read in these texts and read the whole parable. Read the whole parable. Let, let it sit on your heart. Let God teach you what He really wants to teach you. Every indication we read in these texts is that this father was a good father. He was a godly father. He loved his children. He worked hard. He was a good example. He taught good lessons to his children. And yet, his son left. And let and yet he said, Give me my portion. And yet he took that portion and he went and he lived riotous living, unfruitful for God, hurtful to God, hurtful to the Father. But the Father knew he had to let him make his own choices. His son left, made ungodly choices, but again, this parable. Although we can glean so much from the Son, as we have discussed some up to this point, I still know in my heart this is truly about the Father. After the Son went his way, he blew every bit of that inheritance. He started working for a man in the pig pens, and he realized what he had done. He made up his mind, I want to come home. And this is where God continues to teach us about Himself. This is where God really teaches us about these decisions we make and about who He is. Listen to these powerful words again to this revelation God needs us to understand, beginning with verse 17. And when He came to Himself, and leave it right there, the younger son came to himself. He realized what he had done. He realized he was in want. He was lacking something that he 
have nothing. Inheritance or not, this is a place we must all come to. People made in the image of God, Christian or not, you are made in the image of God and you must come to the place, whether you have this grand inheritance or no inheritance. I am nothing. You must come to yourself. And this young man saw it. He came there. He saw it. When I am not with him, when I am selfish, when I am living for myself, I am not right. I am not where I need to be. And when you come to that realization, it breaks you. It hurts. It makes you want to turn around and go the other way and go to your father. Because you realize when you come to yourself, he was right. He knows what is best. And he wants you to have all the things that you need in this life. And that's exactly what happened to this younger son. Look at verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. How did this son know? Listen to this. How did he know he sinned against heaven? Did you notice that? That was his response. He said in his heart first, after he came to himself, I have sinned against heaven. This is what I'm going to say to my dad. Father, I've sinned against heaven. Where did he learn that? Where did he learn that? How did he know? In this parable, he sinned against his father. He took all of his portion of inheritance from his father and blew it on riotous living. We read that. But why did he say he sinned against heaven? Because it's obvious. This is what his father taught him. (laughs) It's so obvious. His father taught him. This is what he learned in his home. Every violation, every transgression he committed in his heart towards his earthly father, he first committed it against his heavenly father. Do you understand? A good father teaches his children about their heavenly father. First. It was like his father said, I know you sinned against me. He taught him this. He sinned against him by taking that inheritance and blowing it. But he first sinned against his heavenly father. And his father taught him that. You sinned against heaven. You sinned against the God of all eternity. You sinned against your heavenly father. And that is where God and you are hurt the most. My children ever transgressed or sinned against me? Oh, it's going to hurt but it's going to hurt him more. And I want my children to know that. That's what the whole world needs to hear and to know. We can sit against each other. You can sit against your parents or your best friend or your sibling, but when you sin, you sin against God first in your heart. We have a world that cries foul all the time about what is right, what is wrong in their own eyes. We have a church today that picks and chooses what is best for them and thinks it will make a real difference in the world. No, it won't. You preach the whole counsel of God. Where is it? What is the difference in the church of Jesus Christ? What difference are they making? We have mega churches. We have large churches. We have medium-sized churches. Call it whatever you want. And I look out at this world and I ask myself, I cry in my heart and I cry to God, what difference are you making? God, help us. Why are you not teaching God's people and all people about this Father in heaven? You see what this parable is about? I know we learned so many great lessons about this son, this younger son. God uses it all. But I take away as a primary teaching 
of the prodigal son, the lost son, my father. Look at his character. Look how he handled it. Look what he taught us. You have a choice, son. You choose. You're accountable. And I thank God he came to himself, don't you? He came to himself. Why are we not teaching about this Father in Heaven? The Father who made you in the moral image of Jesus Christ? You have choices to make every day. And choices have consequences. God's people need to know that. Are we teaching about the Father who says, My grace is sufficient for you? You can do what I call you and ask you to do. If I reveal to you what is wrong, it is wrong. You got to know it in your heart, and know that my grace is sufficient. The Father who says, "Yes, I love you," but you can't live like you want to live. That's where the church is failing. God's standard is supreme and right and pure and holy. You can't live how you want to live. You live the way I call you to live. You live by my truth. Our message is titled today, A True Father's Desire. A true father. I put that word in there, that adjective, on purpose. A true father desire. There are lots of fathers out there today. We're celebrating Father's Day. And thank God for them. Thank God for the role that they are. And some people, unfortunately, today aren't so grateful for their father. But listen, you have a father who knows what he's doing, who knows what he's talking about, who knows what he designed was right. And we are learning, we are celebrating a lot of fathers out there today. But a true father, not just any father, a true father, a real man, a real father, dare I say, teaches his children to love the Lord with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is a true father. He teaches them. As Proverbs 22, 6 says, some of you can quote it, you don't have to turn there. It says, train up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Fathers, mothers, don't misunderstand this text. Train up your child in the way he should go, the way of the Lord. Teach them his truth always and forever. Teach them. And when the, Lord says, when the Lord says, do not, they will not, shall not depart from it, it doesn't mean they will love God their whole life. It doesn't mean they don't have choices to make. It means they won't depart, and they can't depart from the training you give. And that's why the Lord says to train them. When he is old, he will not depart from it. He won't depart from that training. He can't get away from it because you did what God told you to do. And God's Spirit is more powerful. God's truth is more powerful than their mind that says, I don't, I want to forget. They can't forget it. They can't forget it. It's something they can never get away from. Can they choose to live riotously, as this young man did? Can they choose to go their own way? They certainly can. But listen, your responsibility is to train them. Train them before God. That is what the father did in Luke 15. How do we know? Because the, the, the younger son, he said first, what did he say? We've already said it. I've sinned against heaven. It's the first thing he said when he said, I'm going to my father. I've sinned against heaven. And as I close our message this Father's Day, I want to say this about a true father. A true father doesn't just teach. You hear that? A true father. A godly father doesn't just teach. A true father lives what he teaches. A true father sets an example. He believes the truth that he knows. He allows God to lead his life in a way that is consistent with what he teaches. And his greatest desire for his children is that they know what he knows.
That's what our Heavenly Father is trying to do for us every day of our life. Know what I know. God is to be the center of your universe, your life. A true father's desire is for their children to live. I've told my my kids countless times, I don't care what you do in life. I really don't. I don't care if you go to college. I don't care what your profession is. But if you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, body, strength, I will be a happy dad. A true father's desire is for his children to live. In verse 24, the father said to his son these meaningful and powerful words. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And this is what God wants for all of you today. This is what would make him the happiest father in heaven if you are loving him. Fathers, teach your children to love God. Mothers, teach your children to love God. And if you have no children, be the kind of parental figure by way of principle to all children that God clearly teaches. God help us. This world is desperate. And I can't say that word enough. Desperate for this kind of father and mother and parents in this world. Look at this world. It is a mess. People need the Lord. I know the Father in heaven, and I'm going to teach you about him. Be committed to that. Nothing would bring our Father in heaven more joy. So I ask you as we leave, are you there today? Are you where you need to be before God? Trusting Him with your lives, setting a godly example in this world? The world needs it. As much as I hate to say it, the church needs it. It's so sad. The church needs it. Ask God to help you do it, and He will help you do it. Play your part. Don't look at the world and think it's hopeless. There's no, there's no chance. Make a difference where you can make a difference. Do what God calls you to do. Amen. Would you do that today? Brad, we're going to sing an invitation. What number? 121. Please, please stand. We're singing an invitation.